Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight we will get to as many questions as we possibly can, Hello, just you, like Jean. always. But first, I want to say hi to you, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. How are you? Well, hi. what do you think we're doing? We're, we're doing all right. Happy yeah. Sunday. Happy Labor Day weekend. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's really it's really cloudy and chilly here um, in Portland for Labor Day. And I didn't expect that. I, I was hoping for, you know, a nice sunny end of end of the summer weekend but it's supposed to be that way i know but it's not it's 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 well cold. there aren't you know there aren't even any boats out nobody's out today it's still consistent enough with with the kind of weather we have in the north west united states to not yes. declare any emergencies yes you know it, it, it's comfortable here you know? oh, yes, yeah. i don't know about the rest of the country good grief so anyway uh yeah things are going well here we just uh today sunday we had a memorial for one of my longtime better professional friends. You know, those of you who follow my career along the way know I associated with a few really nice people. <laughs> and uh, one of them passed away um, last couple of weeks ago. Last, last week? Last week has been like 10 days ago. Yeah. So. Yeah. He yeah. yeah, goes by the by the name doctor, but he's not an MD, he's a PhD. And I, I told him that's good. You know, the fact that you're not an MD is probably a good idea. So Hans Diels his name, and he did the CHIP program, which is the coronary heart intervention program. When I was a young man, like 30 years ago, I would go and lecture for him all over the country. And it was a program tied, tied with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and now it's tied with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So anyway, he passed away, which, you know, as Mary said, <laughs> we're, we're losing some of our contemporaries at our age. And it doesn't feel very good, I don't think. No. <laughs> But anyway, we're going to try and stretch it out as long as we can, you know, be here as long as we can, be in as good a shape as we can be, because you know what they say. <laughs> anyway, uh, we did quite an honor. If you want to learn about Hans Deal, you can go to our website, drmcdougall.com, and you can put in Hans Deal in the question box. And there's an interview I did with him. I did interviews of the people that I thought were most important during this particular time period, which was the 70s, well, be, well, I started in the 70s, started in the 70s, 80s, oh, 90s. Yeah. You know, I did Nathan Pritikin in the well, early 80s. I did uh, I did uh, Dennis Burke in the early 80s. And, you know, some, Swain, you did him. Yeah, I did. I, I, yeah, I did him when I was at St. Lena Hospital. So anyways, I put together these lectures and I had them really, really high quality filmed. So there's a great lecture that uh, talks about Hans D. Illness. I went through the discussion this morning and I said, look, you might want to turn off your screen because I'm going to introduce you to an interview that I did with Dr. Hans Deal probably 25, 30 years ago, because I knew a time would come when we'd have to have a record of this man and his accomplishments. And so I filmed it. You know, we had high professionals in there, big cameras and stuff like that. You know, because you need to know about what's happened in the past so that you can deal with things now and get ready for the future. So anyway, uh, if you want to learn about Hans Deal, he's promoted a similar program to the one I recommend. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine is now supporting the, the uh, CHIP program. So hey, get involved with CHIP. It's worth your while. It's a community program. There may be one in your neighborhood, and I mean in neighborhood all around the world. So it'd be worthwhile making some friends there, getting some help with it. It's a, the CHIP program, American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Anyway. That's uh, what we did today, which was pretty good. And uh, it was nice to see all of his friends, Colin Campbell and Elselstone and Wayne Dysinger and a whole bunch of other people that have been hanging around together for the last 50 years trying to get people to come to their senses. Uh, yeah, that was, that was uh, you know, a good thing. It was a passing time, you know that. Anyway, I got uh, kind of excited this week about the fact that the, the Congress has been dealing with the drug companies. And they've been offering a bunch of drugs at a discount. And what they did is they offered you 10 drugs. And you thought it was a big deal, right? <laughs> and, and, they, and they're supposed to be able to bargain for a good yeah, price supposed to, yeah, yeah. On, these, on these 10 drugs. Right. Well, they're, they run right now. You know, they run like Eliquis and Jardiance and Zeralto and Genuvia. And Farsiga. Thank you, Mary. Farsiga. And also Antresto. 
they run about $500 a month. Isn't that interesting that they're all about the same price? Could this be price fixing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know how they ask questions. You know, you don't make statements, you ask questions. Anyway, uh, they all run about 500 bucks. Uh, that's the price that you have to pay now, but with the new regulations, they're going to negotiate a better price. Anyway, you've got something for, you got two drugs for thinning the blood. And good grief, how many people are there with atrial fibrillation that need this? Or deep, deep venous, venous thrombosis. That's where you use these blood thinning medications like Xeralto and Aliquest. Doesn't seem like a big market share to me. It doesn't seem like the drug companies would be suffering too much. You know, by giving a discount to the few people who have atrial fib. You know, it's common, but it's not that common. And then we have um, our three diabetic drugs, uh, Jardiens and Farsiga and uh, what's the other one? Genuvia. Yeah, that work by different me mechanisms. And, um, you know, they, these are, they're, I don't know, they're lower blood sugars, what they do. Do they make people healthier? No. <laughs> no, in fact, they increase the risk of uh, all kinds of side effects, you know, uh, fungal infections in your groin. Uh, you know, they're, they're really serious drugs. People die from these drugs. Anyway, uh, the point being is if we get the food fixed, you would not need any of these medications for type 2 diabetes. And even type 1 and a half, you'd, you'd, you'd cause almost all people who are on these medications to reduce or stop. We, we got our results published, our 90% of people are able to reduce or stop their medications in seven days. And that would be these medications right here. We reduce or stop them in seven days, at nearly 90% of people. Now, I tell you, I think that's a bargain. You know, I think that, that you talk about a discount. How about a 100% discount? Don't take them. <laughs> you know, fix the food. Anyways, there's uh, Ernest uh, and, and, and Tresto. And Tresto's for heart failure. How many people do you see with heart failure? You know, maybe if you're a medical resident working in some high-tech hospital, you see a few. Not many. They didn't give up much when it came to Entresto. And then we do with autoimmune disease. You know, Mary, autoimmune disease, I don't know whether you can think back that far. But they used to be really rare, like rheumatoid arthritis oh, yeah. and lupus. Yeah. And There were only a few that you yeah. ever heard about. And you worked in an orthopedic doctor's office, and you would have seen all the rheumatoid patients and so on. Yeah. You know, weren't very many. But, you know, with the explosion of the Western diet, and uh, with you know, contact with unhealthy food that damage your immune system and your gut lining and cause a leaky gut, we've developed a situation where you know it's, it's it's people claim they have these autoimmune diseases. And I don't doubt that they do, but they shouldn't have because they're due to animal proteins in their diet. The body gets confused; it reacts to the animal protein and ends up attacking themselves. They're autoimmune diseases. Anyway, they've got a, they throw in a drug here for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Know a lot of people with that? I don't think so. <laughs> Which but, one is that? Uh, this one is Ambrosia. Ambruvica. Ambruvica. Okay. Uh, anyways, for blood cancers. For blood cancer. And it costs uh, like $13,000. And then Stellara? Stellara is uh, like, uh, it's one of your anti-inflammatory drugs. Oh, okay. You know, like, uh, you know them all. You listen to the ads. I have even heard about these things not, not that, 50 30. years ago. 30, 40 years ago, autoimmune diseases were, you know, maybe I'd see two or three a year. But now, you know, it seems like pretty much everybody's got them. And I think they do. I think they're really sick because they've exaggerated the Western diet in the last 40 years. You know, it used to be that, uh, you know, only about, you know, only about 40% of people were overweight and or obese. Now it's 80%. Yeah, I mean, this is just what's happened in our lifetime is amazing. And for the drug companies to offer back in repentance these lousy drugs, <laughs> which shouldn't be prescribed anyway, because they're all due to dietary diseases. Oh, you know, I realize that chronic lymphocytic leukemia is not going to be solved with a good diet. And uh, but I, I would expect the autoimmune diseases to get better. But you know, these are drugs that they basically have set aside, aren't prescribed anymore. The ones on TV are getting all the attention, they've got the high price. There are all kinds of autoimmune disease drugs for ulcerative colitis, Crohn's. You never heard about ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. So there's never an, an advertisement on TV. Oh, never. Good never. grief. Now that's all you hear. All right. Well, the stations we watch. Maybe we need better stations, <laughs> Maybe. Mary. Maybe we should get off these 
I just stop watching TV. <laughs> good, good. Well, anyway, uh, if you think this is a big deal, it's not a big deal. Do the drug companies owe us more? Yeah, they do. But what they really owe us is they owe us, they owe you a disclaimer, which should say diet and rheumatoid arthritis, diet and diabetes. They used to say that, diet and diabetes, because these companies knew that you could cure type 2 diabetes with diet. So they all, and all their ads, they put diet and diabetes. Yeah. Well, I want all ads to have a disclaimer, diet and rheumatoid arthritis, diet and lupus, diet and atrial fibrillation. Excuse me. Let's be honest in advertising. If you change your diet, most, most of you will get off of these drugs and get over your diseases. Yeah, I'm here to tell you that. I've been doing this for 58 years. <laughs> Anyway, uh, as usual, big business is just taking their share of the profits. They really don't care. You know, they really, I mean, they take drugs that have a tiny bit of, uh, of benefit to, say, signs and symptoms, never, never cure. And they pay for the studies that support the benefits of the drugs. No independent studies. No surgery. We're going to do all our research ourselves. <laughs> anyway, you're getting, you're getting ripped. You really are. You've been cheated not just by the drug companies, by the whole healthcare system, because they don't do what they ought to do, the disclaimer, diet, and Ozempic. <laughs> diet and Ozempic, yes. Yeah, no, really, come on, that's what you're, everybody's buying is Ozempic. Yeah, I noticed they didn't put Ozempic on there. No, why not Ozempic or Wagovi? Those are the big sellers. Come on, guys. <laughs> or how about something like Metformin, which, you know, half the diabetics are on. You know, yeah. how, about, how about getting with us and give us something that's really worthwhile? Anyway, uh, don't be overwhelmed by the generosity of the drug companies. And don't be overwhelmed by physicians stepping up to the line and telling you the truth, because they're not. And it's the only excuse I give them is they don't really care. They don't care enough to do the research, because the science is absolutely clear. Absolutely, without any doubt. And you know, I've shown you the science. I've given you the research. I've told you the stories. And it's up to you and your doctors and your mother-in-laws, et cetera, <laughs> to read the research and show me that I'm wrong. As I say, I've been at this for 58 years. And I'm a board-certified internist. I'm, <laughs> I'm licensed in four states to practice medicine. I got, I'm an associate cl assistant clinical professor, I think, in two or three universities. I'm, I'm a big deal, folks, so <laughs> get with it. <laughs> you know a thing or two, Dad, that's for sure. If I need any advice, I'm coming to you first. <laughs> Good. All right. Anything else you want to share on that topic, or do you want to get to no, some? Oh no, I just I just wanted to address the drugs, and you know, people get overwhelmed by progress being made, but we're so far behind. You know what's happening to you and your children and your spouses is so so criminal. You know, to have the all these eighty percent of the illnesses people have are due to the food, and nearly eighty percent are cured. By switching to a starch-based diet. Have I mentioned that? Has anybody <laughs> contradicted me? I don't think so. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm not, maybe, maybe I'm not popular enough. I think the person is, I'm not putting a hole in their pocketbook. That, that's what one of my friends uh, said about, about mammograms. Uh, he used to lecture all over the world about the fallacy of mammograms. And he was giving a lecture to a group of doctors. And, and one doctor came up afterwards and said, oh, you better understand this, buddy. You're getting in my pocketbook, and I don't like it. So I'm not getting in their pocketbook. That's obviously the problem. Come on, guys, help me. Go out there and tell your friends and relatives there's an option. You've seen it. You've experienced it. This is not a bunch of fluff. Start a revolution. I'm done, Heather. Oh, yeah. I'll take that. that. Sounds great. Okay. Lots of questions coming in. Okay. First one from Jeffrey. He says he's going to be needing two dental implants and will need donor tissue and bone grafts to prep yeah. the gums. Is this recommendable? And does he need to worry about dental implants causing metal toxicity? Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not an expert on dental implants, although, you know, in my family, we've had to deal with that. So I do know a little bit about it. I would consider dental implants one of the modern medical miracles. Uh, you go through this procedure with a competent, oral surgeon, and you're going to think you got your original teeth back. It's a phenomenal surgery. And, uh, you know, I highly recommend it, but you're going to put a year in. You're going to spend at least $5,000 a tooth if it's done by the right people. 
Now, one of the things that's concerning is they would need to have in the, in the uh, where they put the, the post. So you put a post in, you put a metal post in the jawbone, either up or down. And then what you do is you screw this uh, tooth on the top of this implant. So, you know, they need to have a, a good base for putting the, uh, the, the, the bracket in, you know, putting the, 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 what do they call it, Mary? Or whatever, the little post. They've got to have a, a good bit of jaw. So what they do is they put in uh, grafts, or they put in bone grafts. And uh, you can have these uh, from human tissue, I believe. You can correct me on that one. And that sounds kind of interesting, doesn't it? And they, and they, have a, they usually get it from animals. You think so? Though. I think so. Well, anyway, that doesn't sound like a good idea. But you know what? It's a miraculous operation. Sometimes you have to take a, a few compromises to get you these. You have to have enough bone there in order for the implant to have Stick. Some something to stick in. Yeah, so you got to build the so job. you have to have. Well, th th that's what they say, and I I, I have to refer to them because they're experts. I mean, the people I know in this business really take it serious. And uh, anyway, so you know, you have a little graft put in there. It's not, you know, it's not ideal, but it's not a big give up. So be pleased. It's going to take you about a year. Take you about a year to get your teeth back. So you want to take care of the good care of the ones you got. But anyway, I, I, I don't think you're going to be disappointed as long as you don't have a, you got it. This brings me up to the point. You've got to have a, a great technician doing this. There are some bad hands and there are some good hands out there. There are people who go to work drudgingly every day. And then there are people who are artists and can hardly wait to get in your mouth and make things right. You know, you need to pick somebody who's, well, I would, I would pick somebody who's totally dedicated. That's all they do. Not somebody who puts a filling in over here and, you know, whatever, you know, cut some dumb gum disease over here. I want somebody who just spends their time doing posts and, and sticking teeth on. You got to go to a dentist to get the teeth on. You don't. A normal <laughs> surgeon doesn't do that. You go to the dentist. Anyway, it's a good operation. So I think you're going to be pleased. Just shows you Dr. McDougall doesn't completely condemn the medical business or dental business. No, sorry. I, I try and sort out the things that I know are good. There's some really wonderful things in modern medicine. But this is one of them, just like uh, replacement of hips and maybe replacement of knees and maybe replacement of shoulders. You know, I, I'm throwing a maybe there because there was a time when these were not such good operations. But a lot has happened in you know, the last couple of decades. And so they may have worked out some of the, some of the problems with these, with these uh, shoulders and knees and ankles and you know, this is where Mary spent her life. I met her in <laughs> Al Swanson's operating room. Al Swanson was the most famous orthopedic surgeon in the world. And I'm not joking. He had 176 clinics around the world. And what Al Swanson developed, you can look him up. Look up Al Swanson. That was her surgical nurse, where Mary was. And uh, he was a really difficult man, to say the least. I figured <laughs> if Mary could put up with Al Swanson, she could put up with me. And I'm not joking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Big Al, he uh, he did these silastic implants back 50 years ago, and people with terribly deformed joints, and he would he was just such an artist. Anyway, they went through surgical nurses left and right until he met Mary, and then when I told him I was going to marry Mary, he was upset, <laughs> to say the least. I said, oh, "Look, you know, life goes on. I, I I think it's important that." She spends her time. With he me. was the only up. Uh, he was upset because you were taking me away from him. That's, That's why he was upset. Reason. That's the only reason. Yeah. No, he was an older man. He was probably 60, 70 years old. Anyway, uh, and you know, there's some good things out there. Next question. Well, the second part of his question was whether he needed to be worried about metal toxicity with the fillings. Oh, I don't think so. I know it's fine. Again, you're 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 talking to a non-expert, okay? So you can correct me on any of this, but you know, what I remember is they use titanium. Yeah, I was going to say they use titanium. Which is very non-reactive metal. But it's something I would look up. I, I think it's unusual. But I'll tell you, I had one problem. Uh, it was one of my windsurfing partners. Uh, name, his name was Richard. He and I used to windsurf all the time in Bodega Bay. And Richard had a hip done. <clears throat> but they did a, a new metal. I think it was cobalt. And uh, he had a terrible reaction to it. In fact, so bad that they had to take his hip out and put a new one in. But they were just experimenting around with a new, new procedure, a new metal. So don't do that. You know, don't get involved in an experiment. 
you don't want to be you don't want to be part of the, the of an experiment that turns out doing you harm. Get it with a tried true method, and titanium's been around a long time. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Terry. Um, she is one of those women that after a mammogram, um, it came back that she had dense breast tissue. Is this something that she needs to worry about? Yes, yes, she does. Uh, a guy named Boyd back in 1981, published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science. B-O-Y-D is his name. He published a, a experimental study where he did, where he put people on a low fat diet in the direction we recommend. And he found that they reduced the density of the breast tissue, I believe it was in half with a low fat diet. Now, why would this be important? Well, because the diet stimulates the breast tissue and causes it to become dense. The diet also stimulates the breast tissue, the cells in the ducts of the breast tissue and causes them to turn into malignant cells. So it's the same common denominator. The common denominator that makes the breast dense because it's high estrogen, you know, get the high estrogen from the Western diet. It's the same diet. And it may be the pesticides. It may be some of the chemicals in that diet, but it's the same food that causes uh, breast cancer. And uh, so that's the association. So uh, the dense breast warning should be to you. Now is time to get the food fixed. And my guess is that in a year or so, I, you look, you're going to look up Boyd's study. In but year, dense breasts don't necessarily cause breast cancer. No, it's just an association. It's a common denominator. That's the food causes dense, bre bre dense breasts and the food causes breast so cancer. So if you have a dense breast and you decide you're going to have a mammogram for some reason. Right. That's where you find it on the mammogram. Oh, okay. Um, is it um, something you should worry about? Yes, because it indicates you're eating an unhealthy diet. It's just like okay. dense breasts are associated with obesity. And they really are. Oh, okay. okay. But the common denominator is the diet. Dense, dense breasts are associated with more heart attacks, more type 2 diabetes. See, because the common denominator is the food. So, you know, the fact that there's an association of dense breasts and all these problems, you have to take it back one step to the denominator, which is the food. You know, acne is associated with dense breasts <laughs> you know, because it's the same darn food. Anyway, that's why. So, um, you know, it, it, anyway, the, the bottom line is this should be another warning to you that you should change your diet, just like, like constipation you know, should be a warning. You know, just like an elevated blood sugar should be a warning. You know, just like a high cholesterol, high blood pressure, you know, aches and pains. You should all, they should all be screaming out to you. It's time to fix the problem. The problem's the food. I almost guarantee it. <laughs> In other words, I think you should give us 12 days. I really do. You either do it at home, 12-day programs on our website, free, no gimmicks, absolutely entirely free. It takes a little bit more work than to come into our 12-day telemedicine program where we'll take care of you. We'll make sure you learn everything. You'll make sure you get the medical care that you need and want. So 12 days, I'm gonna come on, come on. If you've got a lifetime you're looking at, could you pick 12 days and find out whether that McDougal guy and his wife and his daughter are giving us a bunch of BS or not? Come on, 12 days, do it. <laughs> you won't be coming back here saying it didn't work. I'll have to say you didn't do it. <laughs> anyway. We have the next question. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Carol. She's been taking D -minose, minose powder mixed in water for eliminating UTIs, and it's helped her get rid of them. Have you ever heard of it? Or what well, would you we'll recommend? It it's D um, hyphen minose. M it, sounds like a, it sounds like a sugar. Dextrose minose is a sugar. So she she's taking a sugar, I believe. Oh, maybe. Yeah, okay. It's a, isn't that what it is, man? D. It's D dash monos M O N O S E. M M A N N O S E. Okay, M A N O S. I always thought cranberry juice was what you took when you had a it's sugar. Isn't it sugar? Come on, it's a sugar. Pure monos, it's a sugar. Pure D S E. It's a sugar. 
Anyway, it's just like glucose, OSE. Yeah. Or lactose, OSE. Is a Manose, OSE. It's a sugar. It's a sugar. I can't imagine why. Aldohexo series of carbohydrates. Thank you, Mary. I, I, I can't imagine that taking a simple sugar like that would cure anything unless you change it for a pork chop. <laughs> then it might. You know, I'm sorry, folks. There's a sucker born every day. What I would do to find out whether you fall into that category or not is I would go to the internet and put in D manos and whatever problem you're worried about and ask for randomized control trials, you know, and, and see whether or not anybody's done any research on. It. I know what you're going to find. You're going to find, you know, several dozen advertisements for products that they sell on Amazon and other places. Well, that oh, that's problem. what came up first. Yes, yeah, so a whole list of, course it's, of uh, all these powders. This is this is this is just, you know, it's tomfoolery with your money, <laughs> stealing your money. So, but, if you do have a UTI, what do you recommend? Oh, I, okay, that was the, thank you, Heather, for the second half of the question. I recommend. Oh, that's why I know the connection here. The connection is that mannose is a sugar that's present in blackberries and cranberries. Oh, oh there's the connection. I'm sorry, you didn't catch me. I got, I'm a little slow tonight. <laughs> but mannose is the sugar that prevents the attachment of the bacteria in the bladder. And that's what it is. So, you know, rather than taking the cranberry juice or the blackberry juice, which is full of, you know, high concentrations of D-mannose, she's buying a supplement, which, you know, as I said, look it up. You know, if, if it works and you could take D-mannose and stop or prevent urinary tract infection, somebody ought to have researched it. I would think so, but I've heard about it before. Now that now you throw that connection to the bladder in there, bladder infections. I got it, but mm -hmm. uh, so it may be of value. But I, again, you you got you as a customer. It's not that hard these days to figure it out. Just go to Google, put in manos and urinary tract infections and randomized control trials, or just I use the term RCT because I don't want to spell it all the way out. I use RTC, <laughs> RCT, randomized control trials. Absolutely. So yeah, give it a try. Look for some research. But I, I always recommended uh, cranberry juice and blackberry juice. You can buy it as a pill. You can also buy it in your grocery store in a quart bottle. If you buy it in a quart bottle, you need to drink the whole bottle at one time. You've got to get high concentrations of this mannose in your bladder to prevent the attachment of the bacteria to the cells of the bladder. That's what I should have told you first of all. So maybe that's why they sell it in pill form because drinking a whole bottle of that yeah. stuff would be awful. That's why they do it. That's why they do it. So would it be better to take blackberry or cranberry juice or the concentrated mantles powder? I don't know. I don't know. I've always prescribed the, the juices. You know, I'm kind of, kind of stepping back to the natural attitude. But that's the only reason why it's not because it's, I know it's any better to take the powder versus the whole fruit. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Sandy. She's wanting to know if plant-based diet will benefit a pinched nerve in the back. Well, probably not. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, it's just. It, it, it is unrelated to the food as far as it causing it, unless you have degenerative disc disease. Degenerative disc disease is where the disc between the spine bones, you know, in your back, we're talking about your back now. The disc, there are cushions between the spine bones, mm -hmm. which are called discs. You know, they're thoracic discs, lumbar discs, cervical discs, and they provide cushions between the, the, the bones of the back. And these uh, cushions, they have circulation. You know, from a branch of the aorta. They go in and supply the backbone with blood, oxygen, remove waste products. Well, what happens is you give it atherosclerosis in these arteries that supply the backbone and you get degenerative disc disease. Next time somebody asks you or tells you when you have a lumbar disc rupture or any disc rupture, they tell you, well, you got degenerative disc disease, ma'am, sir. You say, okay, why did it degenerate? I mean, it's not like I picked up a piano or a Volkswagen. I just took a step and it broke. 
It was degenerated. Why does it degenerate? Why did it break under almost no pressure at all? Well, that's because it was degenerated because they had a low blood supply, the same way your heart and your brain end up with strokes and heart attacks. You have a heart attack in your back, basically. So in that way, now, can it reverse itself? I don't think so. Uh, I mean, if you lost some weight and that was putting some mechanical strain on your back, yeah, that might make all the difference in the world. So you might think about it from that point of view. Uh, there's some work that says that uh, a high carbohydrate diet will actually help with any kind of pain. And Dr. Neil Bernardo did a lot of this work. So, you know, from that point of view, it might help. But as far as making the degenerative disc that's collapsed healthy again, it's not going to do it. So, but you know me, I always say change your diet anyways. Doesn't matter whether you wear a blue shirt or a red shirt today, you still need to eat potatoes. That's pretty political. <laughs> well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Pretty political. I think so. Blue shirt, blue shirt or red shirt. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's get on way. Thank you. Uh, next question. This is from Vegan Hondo. Do you have any experience with arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia cardiomyopathy? Wow, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Arrhythmogenic, so it's it's due to atherosclerosis. The genetic needs cause. Gen, you know, it, it begins genetic. Atherogenic. Genic is a word that talks about uh, the, the destruction, the beginning, et cetera. So it's artery genic, atherogenic. So it's disease of the arteries, atherosclerosis of the arteries, which resulted in some type of heart damage, uh, left ventricular dysfunction or what was, what was the second part of the question right ventricular uh dysplasia cardiomyopathy okay well that's fair enough uh, cardiomyopathies are they can be due to poisons uh, like for example cobalt uh, and people who are beer drinkers they you know they had a study where they drank beer with a whole bunch of cobalt in it and it damaged their their heart and they had to go into cardiomyopathy but most of the myopathy is due to disease of the small vessels to the heart. Uh, Robert Atkins is uh, one of the best examples of how this happened. Robert Atkins, you know, the Atkins diet. He's been, he's been in my space for, it was until he died. And that's interesting. He died. I'm not still alive. <laughs> anyway, uh, Robert Atkins, uh, he used to brag about how he had uh, no heart disease, had, uh, clean angiograms went on uh, went on the Larry King show and said he had a perfectly, perfectly normal heart. Well, I, I had his angiograms, by the way, before they got burned up in the fire. I could probably still find them again. They were dirty. They were full of atherosclerosis. Don't let them kid you. And also uh, his situation was when, uh, when he died, he fell, they said, on the ice in April in New York City. Well, so happens that the report of the weather that day in New York City was no ice. Probably, probably, I think what happened is he, he died and then he fell. I don't think he fell and then he died. Anyway, he had cardiomyopathy. And I sent some articles. Well, actually, I put it in one of the newsletters that showed that cardiomyopathy is due to disease of the small vessels of the heart. Now, why this is important is on an angiogram, you can see the big vessels. You see the plaques, the blockages, the atherosclerosis. You can see it. But in the more distal arteries, you know, the tiny little arteries that supply the muscle and the nerves to the heart. They're so tiny that you, you can't see it, but it's still atherosclerosis. I mean, why would you think disease that makes your aorta sick, which is that big around, and makes your coronary arteries sick, which is like they're about that big around. Why would you think that same blood flowing through the arteries wouldn't make the tiny arterial sick? Think about it. So anyways, you close off the arteries and the small arteries, the muscles damage, you get cardiomyopathy, and that's what I believe Robert Atkins died of from his diet. Well, if you switch to a plant-based diet, can you get off your beta blockers and improve this? Uh, uh, well, you know, beta blockers are given for a different reason, Heather. They're given to slow the rate of the heart. And what that means is that it's, the beating slows enough. That's what beta blockers do is they slow the rhythm of the heart, the rate. And, and that gives the heart enough time to fill with blood. And that's why beta blockers help when it comes to cardiomyopathy. You would think they wouldn't. I mean, when I first learned about this, I was in medicine probably 15, 20 years. Beta blockers were always used because they 
basically poisoned the muscles, the cardiovascular system. They are beta blockers. They block epinephrine. In fact, they block it so severely that some people can't walk up three steps. You know, when I we originally treated the first 15 years of my practice, beta blockers were something you'd never give anybody with heart failure because they poison the heart muscle. But what it turned out, and it was, I don't know that I understand it today, but you know, I've been living with this type of information for 35 years. The idea being that if you slow the heart, you you give it extra time to fill up and therefore it can squeeze more blood out with every beat and so it improves the circulation. Can you get off the beta blocker? I don't know, probably not. I would connect it with diet. You've already got the damage done with the small arterioles and the, and the muscles already dead. You want to eat a healthy diet because you don't want to have things happen in other places in the body. Remember, I told you, there's a common denominator. So now it's cardiomyopathy. You know, next month it's a stroke. And then the, your legs get gangrene. And you can't get an erection if you're a male. You know, it's the whole cardiovascular system. So, yeah, you've got to change your diet. But is it going to make the heart, heart muscle regrow? No. Will it give the heart muscle a little extra time to fill? Yeah. That's why they prescribe it. And uh, anyway, that's that's a long story short. Yes, you need to change your diet. No, it's not going to fix your, your dead heart muscle, which it is. It's dead. Some of the muscle's dead. You've got enough to make it another 30, 40 years, though. So take good care of that. Take good care of yourself. You know, you know, you know the saying, as Hans Deal appreciated last week, you know the saying is, well, I have to go. You just want to delay it and have as much fun as possible in the meantime. You know, I think that I think those are the rules, Mary. Unless you found some special diet that's going to really make me live to be a thousand. <laughs> no? Darn. I have to, I have to. I'd hate to see you. I will, I'd hate to see you walking around at a thousand. You know, I'm I, sorry. One of my fear to get any longer. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, I just want to promise you, Mary, I'm going to make the best of the time we have left together. Oh, I'm sure you will. And we're just going to enjoy each other and our family and the work I do. I love, I love my work. We're just going to do that until whatever. It's going to happen, though. <laughs> <laughs> so get real, folks. you got a certain amount of time. You might as well make the best of it. I mean, good grief. You might as well feel as good, function as well, and, you know, and look as good as you possibly can. Don't you think? The problem is the food. Just 12 days. You know, we'll talk to you two weeks. You will find out that Mary and I and Heather have got a good message. Which reminds me, you ought to bring more people to this five o'clock session on Sunday nights. We've doubled our census. So we're really, really excited that you're, that you're turning on friends and relatives to this message. How else are they going to learn? They see you lose weight. They see you get off pills, feel better. The people who love you and respect you, they want to know. Maybe they don't want to know the first time or the second time you tell them. But eventually, <laughs> you're going to get through to them. So just keep it up. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Dan. He says he's been vegetarian vegan for 53 years. Wow. His doctor says his scores are unbelievably great. He takes no medication, yet he's still overweight. Is this bad? Well, obviously it concerns you because you brought up the question. You How know, overweight? Yeah, I mean, I, well, he's more, he, he looked at it, he took off his clothes. And he looked in the mirror and he didn't like what he saw. That's overweight enough. <laughs> you know, you don't have to do a BMI. You don't have to get on a chart and do height and weight. Just look in the mirror. Are you happy with what you see? And if you're not, then let's fix it. And uh, it usually, let me, let me tell you the reasons that people uh, are not doing as well as they could on the diet. One is, is they'll be new to the McDougal program. And they'll be on a regular calorie-restricted diet or one of these low-carb diets. And they will have depleted their system of glycogen, which is glucose. You know, it's a chains of glucose. And uh, you store about two pounds of glycogen in your body and the liver and the muscles and about four pounds of water along with the two pounds of glycogen. So you've depleted all the glycogen on your system by starving or going on the Atkins diet. So when you start on the McDougal diet, you gain back the two pounds of glycogen and the four pounds of water. I don't want to be on this diet. I just gained six pounds. Well, it's not fat. Six pounds of sugar and water is what you gained. But this person has been eating this way for 50 
three years. All right. Well, let's get on to the part of the rest of the story. No, but I mean, you know. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give them some notes. Okay. All right. But I want to make sure everybody understands. Okay. The other thing is there's a hyperphagia that occurs when you first start with the diet. So because you've been starving yourself, you've been in pain of hunger for months and years. Your first reaction when you have food available is to eat hyperphagia. Okay, now let's get on to this person's concern. I've been on the diet for years, 53 years. I'm a vegan. All right, well, being a vegan doesn't mean much to me. Uh, my first friend that was a vegan was a guy named, a guy named Jeff. Jeff was my intern at the Queens Medical Center. I was the resident. And Jeff was an ethical vegan. First one I ever met. This was back in 1974. I remember him. Remember Jeff? Yeah, redhead. Anyway, he was a, he was a, a ethical vegan. So he didn't hurt a fly. He wore uh, plastic belts and nylon shoes. And But Jeff was like 40, 50 pounds overweight and had greasy skin and acne. Jeff's diet was potato chips and Cokes. He was vegan. So let's start there. I mean, what is the vegan diet? The diet that we recommend is a starch. That's why I call it starch. I don't call it whole food plant-based diet. It's a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. Uh, you need to reassess what you're doing and make sure it's not you know, an occasional eating out or you know, I have a little bit of olive oil in my salad. That couldn't hurt. You know, you got to do the diet strictly. And uh, then, then what you do is you induce a couple of principles that we teach. One is the principle of simplicity. And that's taught through uh, Mary's mini diet. It tells you to just pick one starch, a few vegetables, and eat that three, four times a day. The other branch that we offer in people who want to lose more weight faster is they, um, they go on the maximum weight loss program, which gets rid of all flowers. Cut your fruit to one or zero a day. Uh, of course, avoids all nuts and seeds and avocados. And uh, there are a few other things. Anyway, that's the maximum weight loss program. But in answer to your question, there was a, a group of people in South Africa that I studied back in the uh, in the 1980s. Uh, the report of these, they were women, was uh, that they were overweight. I mean, really overweight. And had no diabetes, no high blood pressure, no high cholesterol. In other words, they got overweight eating healthier foods like nuts and seeds and avocados. So yeah, you can be overweight and still in pretty good health, but you don't like the extra weight. So you, that's why you're asking. Do you want to lose that extra weight? Can't, can't, let me answer the question. Can you be healthy and overweight too? Yes. It sounds to me like you would rather be healthy and trim too. So those, that's what you do. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Aqua Pumpkin. How fast or slow should someone transition to a starch-based diet if they are currently doing huge amounts of meat, like a carnivore? <laughs> Over, overnight. <laughs> it, it's easier just to do things. Uh, or cutting down doesn't work. You know, I often give the example of uh, cigarette smokers. I've never seen a cigarette smoker quit by cutting down. Likewise, I've never seen an alcoholic sober up by switching to beer and wine. It doesn't work that way. You need to make a decision. You need to, you need to practice up until that day of all the reasons you want to be different. And then that day, you need to say, today I'm a meat eater and tomorrow I'm not. I don't care how much I suffer. And boy, you're going to suffer from tobacco withdrawal and alcohol withdrawal. And maybe you're going to suffer from food withdrawal. I don't care what happens. I'm going to suffer and I'm going to get through the next four days, probably four days, but certainly by 12 days, I'm going to have it all set. And uh, so I, I don't recommend just gradually getting into it. Uh, if you're ready. Now, if you're not ready, that's OK. You can play around here and there. Don't expect results because you know, I know what you're doing. You know, I, uh, what you think is 80 percent could be 50 percent or, you know, so I, let's not play that game. You do it 100 percent and uh, you just give it up just like you would alcohol, heroin, cocaine, or a bad spouse. You just give them up. <laughs> but don't you think if you did it 50 or 75, 80%, you'd still get a ton of results that you know, you would, if you're just eating meat, right? That's more fiber, that's, that's more 
Yeah, yeah, you will. But you know, but when people expect a lot out of us, and when they say, "Well, you know, I kind of follow the McDougal diet," and uh, that really hasn't put us up to the test. You know, so that's why I react that way. Is that uh, people's estimation of how much they follow the program we teach is usually way off. So if somebody says they follow it fifty percent, maybe they have a, a baked potato once a week. What do I know? <laughs> I don't trust him. I don't trust him. I've mean, I've I've seen too many people uh, that just don't quite understand what they're supposed to do or aren't quite ready to do it. That's okay. But you need to know you have that option out there. You need to know you don't have to be sick. You don't have to be overweight. You don't have to take all these drugs. Well, some of them you might have to, but a lot of them. We get ninety percent of people to reduce or stop their medication. Publish. It's a big deal though. I mean, to change from beef steaks to baked potatoes is a big deal. But I guarantee you, once you get there, as I'm sure 99% of the callers that are online right now would tell you, once you get there, you look back and you go, why did I do that before? This is so easy, so effective. But it's not easy in the beginning. If you're starting out and you're you're a, a <laughs> confirmed meat eater, yeah, I have no you have I, to... You don't have any sympathy. I have no sympathy for wimps. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on, let's just get on with it, all right? And that's why we run the programs. That's why we run the 12-day tel telemedicine program, because that Friday, you're committed. <laughs> and you, you've got a support specialist to talk to you every day. You've got uh, John and Mary and Heather to talk to you every day. You've got Doug Lyle and Jeff Novick and you know all of our staff to put you on notice. You know, and you paid some money to come. So, you know, it's a value. It's obviously a value because you paid some money to come. But you want to get it taken care of. And that's why we run the programs we do. I, I told you it's free. It's free on the website. You, you will not find anything that's gimmicky on my description of what you do in the program. But yeah. if you Maybe. are unhealthy enough, yeah. you can't just stop whatever you're doing and give up all your drugs and right you don't want to do that you can't do that without having some help yeah we don't recommend that yeah you need some help and of course dr lamb and myself and you know often some other people will help you to make these changes yeah you need some medical advice you here's here's the challenge you need to find a health care provider who is competent in taking care of people who make a change in their diet uh oh, I can't find anybody. Oh, there you, are some. Well, there, yeah, I know there are a few. In fact, I'm going to meet them next week. But, but they're, they're few and far between. Are they any good? I, do you know any doctors who are good at writing prescriptions? Oh, <laughs> God, that's what I learned in, in medical school, right? But, but how about teaching people to, uh, you don't have the education. So you're not going to find a healthcare provider unless you put some work into it. And you could do that. There are organizations out there that are starting to, work in this direction. There's our program, which we've talked to you about a lot. Uh, there is the American College of Lifestyle Medicine CHIP program, where they have people involved. And, you know, you might look into that. That's that's pretty worthwhile. And, well, PCRM, would they have advice? Yeah, they are now. They're finding doctors. doctors yeah, they have yeah. a whole bunch of doctors who are diet oriented. You know, again, I don't know what they're doing. All right. I know, I know what I do. But you know, whether a, a physician who says that he does similar whole food, plant-based diet, et cetera, whether they're doing what we would be doing, yeah, I, I'm, okay. I'm suspicious, you know. It, 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 it took me, it, it, you know, I started doing this, and, and I, when, did I, when did I start? I started in 1977. Well, you were at the Seedley Hospital. Oh, what? I started pushing food instead of drugs. Was that St. Helena? No. Well, I was at, I was uh, in my residency from 73 to 70. Oh, I know. 1985. 80, yeah. yeah 80, 70, I've been doing this since 1985. That's all I've done. I've learned a few things along the way. I had a few <laughs> mistakes, you know, not many. But anyway, good luck. We'll take care of you. When, when the point comes where you've decided that you want to have the McDougal program, then you know where McDougal is. Thank you.
Okay, next question. This is from the experiencer. What gets damaged in the kidney when you have chronic kidney disease due to hypertension? Oh, that's a good question. How do I tell you? Some of these people have mm -hmm. amazing questions that I've thought about my whole life. You know, the, the, the thing that I believed and most doctors believe today is that the elevated pressure damages the arteries throughout the body the kidneys, the brain, the heart. So we have a vision in our mind that when we were at the raise the blood pressure, say from 140 millimeters of mercury to 160 millimeters of mercury, that the increase in pressure is so great that it would damage the arteries and they fall apart. It's the pressure that does it. That's what, that's what we're taught. Same thing with the kidneys. It's the pressure, but it's not the pressure. You know, I, I showed you in the lecture I gave on high blood pressure and you, you can watch it, it's on. It's on YouTube. Uh, look up McDougal and hypertension. I, I showed you. I showed you weightlifters who lift barbells, and their pressure was like 480 over 350 millimeters of mercury. Not a vessel breaks. In experiments done with a special setup, where they take a pump and attach it to an artery from the brain, a human brain, they find you have to increase the pressure to 1,700 millimeters of mercury before any vessels break. It's not the pressure damages the arteries any place. What happens is the diet that you eat makes the arteries sick. It makes them sick. They get full of atherosclerosis. They, they uh, shrink in their lumen. The, the, the hole through its blood gets to flow becomes narrower because of the sickness of the arteries. The artery walls become, become more sick. You, you stop supplying nutrients and, and blood to the kidneys and the brain and so on. So it's it's the rotten arteries that cause the high blood pressure, which cause the strokes in the kidney. And it's the food that causes the rotten arteries. It's not depression, but but that's the that's the uh, the rabbit hole we've gone down. That's the false god that we're chasing is if I just lower the pressure from 160 to 140 with a little diuretic, I'm going to change this person's life. No way. No way. Maybe if you're really, really sick, you can show some benefit, but not for the average person. Healthy arteries don't break. Sick arteries break under any pressure. And sick arteries fail to develop nutrients to the brain, heart, kidneys, etc. It's the food. That's the food. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you. next question. This is from Elizabeth. She wrote in, how much does alcohol affect rheumatoid and other arthritis? If sticking to the McDougal program, can one have a few cocktails or glasses of wine once in a while? You know, uh, that, that leads me in a whole story, Heather. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to tell it. But uh, for nine out of 10 people, a, a drink occasionally is fine. You know, you enjoy the taste, you enjoy the relaxation, you enjoy the sociability, but one out of 10 people, you don't want to give them a positive message about alcohol. Why? Because they're alcoholics. And they say, well, Dr. McDougall said it's okay to drink. They go and beat the kids or get in an auto accident and kill somebody. So responsible doctors should not in any way attach alcohol to health. That said, I don't think alcohol is going to bother your rheumatoid arthritis. So... Tell you, I'll tell you what beer and wine do do, though. Beer and wine will cause indigestion. You mentioned hard liquor. Hard liquor doesn't cause indigestion. The beer and wine does. There you go. It's worth listening to Dr. McGill's <laughs> show here at 5 o'clock on Sunday. He just told me I could, I could drink hard liquor. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Okay, next question. This is from Dr. Joy Cry. She's wondering if the starch solution is good for healing any disease and if starches feed cancer? Well, uh, starches don't feed cancer, but the low carbers think they do. And they use Otto Warburg's theories, which they've gotten wrong. And, uh, you know, the, these low carbers, they tell you that the low carb carnivore keto diet will cure everything. And they've got enough money to write articles and do cursory experiments to lend to their argument. But it, it just isn't true. Uh, in fact, there's a recent review done, and you'll find this in the lecture I re recently gave on cancer and diet. A recent review done 
in Surgical Oncology Lancet, where they compared a uh, plant-based diet to a keto diet in terms of its benefits for cancer. Keto lost, okay? This is just nonsense taught by the, the low carbers. They're passionate, they're religious about this. You know, I have to believe not only it's because of what's on their own dinner plate, but I have to believe there's some financial interest behind them. I could certainly imagine how the drug companies are helping with this message. I can certainly imagine how the meat and the poultry and the fish industries are happy with this message. Not, not that I'm trying to tell you there's any direct financial, because I haven't looked, uh, cooperation between the two of them, but they're not unhappy to hear you need to eat more meat and dairy and poultry. Guess what? <laughs> They'll tell you it'll cure Alzheimer's, it'll cure uh, everything, everything. And the truth is it'll cause you to lose weight because you're so sick, you can't eat, and anything associated with weight loss, you can accomplish. With weight loss, you reduce your risk of heart disease, you lower your blood pressure, you lower your diabetes, your blood sugar. It's because of the weight loss. You could, you could wire your teeth together. You could go to a prisoner of war camp and starve. You get the same results as with these diets. Or Ozempic, they just make you not eat. You lose weight, so you get healthier. No, you got sick from the program that they taught you, the low-carb diet and the Ozempi. It made you so sick that you lost weight. Now, how does that make you healthier? I don't know. Did I answer the question, Heather? <laughs> <laughs> well, if starches feed cancer, and then I guess oh, the, the first question, part of the question, whether starches are good for healing all diseases. Well, yeah. Let me put it this way. I believe, and I do everything I can to convey to you that belief with you know, my passion in speaking, with the scientific research, with my experience with my patients. I believe this. The human being is a starch eater, a starchivore, a starchitarian. That's our food, just like a cat is a carnivore. You know, and a, a, a cow is an herbivore. We are a starchivore. That's our intended food. So you ask me if it helps everything? Yeah. You know, just like breathing air with oxygen helps everything. <laughs> Drinking a glass with water in it helps everything. You know, eating the right food helps everything because this is what the human being is supposed to eat. So, you know, whether you got wax in your ears or a goo between your toes, yeah, you should eat a good diet. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. But what is caused by unhealthy food is corrected with a starch-based diet. That's what the research says. That's why 99.9999% of people who ever walked this earth have lived on starch-based diets. How many times have I told you that? How many times have I told you that the Native American 12,000 years ago lived on potatoes and or corn? The people in South America, they're known as the people of the corn. Those folks in South America, they lived on potatoes. The, the, the people of the Andes, the breadbasket of the world is not the pork chop basket of the world. It's the breadbasket of the world, which is in the Middle East. And how about the Far East? What do they eat there? Oh, come on now, you guys. Come on, you're old enough. Yeah, rice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, it's well, you got to go back a million years in history and involve 107,000 billion, no, excuse me, 107 billion people. That's, so, that's my latest figure on how many people walk this earth, 107 billion. So that's the only evidence I present, 107 billion of people have walked this earth in a million years of human history and all the scientific research and the results we get. 12 days, do it for 12 days. Come on now, you guys. <laughs> so I'll bet you in two weeks, you're going to be, if you really do it, you're going to be saying, yeah, a little harder than McDougall said, probably not. But it worked. Well, I think it's harder for some people than others. Well, they're not ready, Mary. Uh, and they're not that kind of person either. You know, there are people who, you know, just see a problem and take care of it. And then there are other people who try and get by. I, I you know, so all kinds of different personalities we're dealing yeah. with. But what I do know for sure, and I want to tell you, you can consider this an important promotion of our program, is we are designed to take care of essentially all of these issues. We've got the best psychiatrist in the world. We've got the best dietitian in the world. Got the best exercise person in the world, Jack Dixon. You know, you, you, well, when you have this much talent, what would you expect but great results? 
you know, we put together a program that's been in existence for 36 years, our living programs. You would think we'd learn something in 36 years, wouldn't you? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Come and join us. And just to, to end the discussion, I wanted to make sure people know that I've completed the five lecture series, um, lectures on, on weight loss, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and on, uh, on nutrition. So that series is complete. Heather has it for sale. And uh, the other thing is, is next week on Sunday, a week from today. What are we going to do, Heather, a week from today? You haven't figured well, that out. Gonna be, you're going to be on stage next Sunday, so we won't be live. That's for sure. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we can broadcast it on stage. What do you think of that? Well, I don't know if we oh, have probably. to talk to. <laughs> we'd have to see if that's anyway, a possibility. Uh, but, uh, yeah, next Sunday, we'll, we're we'll gonna, figure something out. But next Sunday, we won't be live, so we'll be missing you. But we'll be back the next Sunday. Well, I'm not convinced we won't be live yet. I'm still <laughs> working on it. Anyway, uh, we're going to do that next. Uh, Next Sunday on the 10th, 10th, yeah, yeah. the 10th of September, 2023. Uh, I'll be receiving something called the uh, Luminary. Luminary Award. I tell you, I got to get that one right before I get it. <laughs> the Luminary Award. And I, I know it's a great honor. I'll be with a lot of good friends. So probably be 500 to 1,000 physicians there that I've had a chance to touch their lives and, and your life indirectly. So anyway, we'll be doing that next Sunday. Great, Heather. Thank you, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougall and Mary. That was a great When's hour. What's the next program? Next, the next program is October 13th. We're already filling up. So if you're thinking about it, if you're on the fence, yeah. I suggest you sign up now. Otherwise, yeah. you'll have to wait till January. So. Oh, boy. No, That's really. A long time. Shoot. I bet you're going to have to add more programs, Heather. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it was a great hour. See you all next. Actually, not next Sunday. See you in two Sundays. Well, we will we'll be here, won't we? Well, we can do a, a, a well, we'll do something. recording. We'll do something. We'll, we'll do something. It just won't be live. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, we'll figure it out. Just be here five o'clock <laughs> Sunday and Pacific we'll, time. We'll be here too. Somebody will be here. Maybe we'll get to. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Have a we'll great figure. rest of your evening, everyone. See you all soon.